Well hi and welcome to our service for the 25th of July. I hope you're well. Um, I'm actually on annual leave at the moment but I've recorded this video and brought it all together so that there is a Sunday video for folks here today. I'm very thankful to Matt Alexander from the Baptist Church who has recorded a sermon for us. I've actually recorded a sermon for the Baptist Church as well and it's really just another way just to share together uh, as churches and our relationship. We want to encourage one another. We're all Christians together. We're trying to reach out together with the good news of Jesus. And so Matt is encouraging us and I'll be encouraging the Baptist Church. Just again about me being away. If you do require the services of a minister between now and when I'm back on after the 1st of August, you would contact the Reverend David Malcolm of Thurzo St Peter's in St Andrews. Also Rob, our mission worker, is off again for another week. And then finally to say uh, that if you didn't see it already, we are going to be providing a one day holiday club event on the afternoon of Wednesday the 11th of August for children going into P2 to P7 and it's going to have a Highland Games theme. And if you'd like more details about that, please do uh, look at our Facebook page and the details are all there. Well, let's begin with our first song. Lord God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God together, we worship and praise you and we give you the glory that is due your name. For you are the wonderful, one, awesome, majestic God who is love and who has set that love upon us, your people, making us your own by Jesus' life and death and resurrection, gathering us to be part of your flock, a people for your own possession, made holy by your grace, where we love and adore you 
and how we thank you for all that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that as we come to worship you today, you would help us to set our eyes upon you, to move our eyes away from the shifting things of this world, and even from ourselves, and to behold you. Lord God, we ask that as we come before you, you would forgive us. For we know that since we last stopped in this way to worship, we have sinned and erred in many ways. We, like sheep, have gone astray. And yet, your love is there for us, as ever, rich and full and freely offered. So Lord God, speak to us again and speak peace to our hearts as we confess our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Renew us today by the Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your word and build us up to live this week ahead in your service faithfully, joyfully, full of thanksgiving and praise. For Jesus' sake we ask. Amen. Good morning to you all at Pultley Town and Thromster Parish Churches and greetings from the congregation at Wick and Keys Baptist Church. It's been a real joy and a pleasure getting to know some of you a bit more over this past year since we moved up. It's been almost exactly two years now since Ruth and Izzy and I came up for the first time to Wick and we, uh, or I filled in for Andrew. And we really appreciate the, uh, the warmth and the friendship that you extended to us on that occasion in particular. And that has provided some of the inspiration for my message this morning. If you have a Bible to hand, then please would you turn with me to John chapter 17. And Ruth is going to read to us from verse 20 to the end of the chapter. The words will also appear on the screen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today's reading is from John chapter 17, verse 20 to 26. Jesus prays for all believers. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be as one, as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Amen. One of the most encouraging truths that we read in the New Testament is that the Lord Jesus is praying for us. He is interceding for us. Paul tells us this in his letter to the Romans. We read in Romans 8, 34, Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And the writer to the Hebrews says something very similar. He writes, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. These are beautiful promises to us, to the church, 
But they beg the question, well, what, what does Jesus pray for us? The passage that we've read this morning from John 17 helps us to answer that question. John 17 as a whole, the whole chapter, contains a prayer that Jesus prayed on the last night of his earthly life. This was directly before he was arrested and tried and then finally crucified. And towards the end of this prayer, in verse 20, Jesus turns his attention from the 11 remaining disciples who he's been praying for to all who will believe in me through their message. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning as your saviour, then this prayer is for you and it is for all of those who have held to this faith in every age and every generation of the church. It is for all of us. So what does Jesus pray for us? Well, I think we see three main things in this passage. We see Jesus praying for uh, unity, unity of the church, togetherness, oneness. He prays that we might see his glory and he prays that we might know the Father. And I'd just like to take each of these three things in turn and think about them. Think about what they mean for us. And so we'll begin with thinking about unity. Where do we see in this passage that we've read Jesus' desire for unity among believers? Well, we see it in three places in very quick succession. In verse 21, Jesus prays that all of them may be one. In verse 22, that they may be one. And then in verse 33, Jesus prays, may they be brought to complete unity. That's a very strong threefold emphasis on unity in the church. The unity of the church is clearly very important to Jesus. He prays persistently for it. So what does unity look like? Is it a kind of uneasy alliance, like a, a press conference, a joint press conference between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin? Well, no. Amazingly, we read in this passage that Jesus is praying for a unity among Christians that is modeled on the relationship that he has with his father. He prays, may they be one, father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one as we are one. This is an incredible thought. The love with which Christians are called to love one another is the, the same love that exists between the persons of the Godhead. So how are we doing? Is unity and pra a, a practical demonstration of Christian love, love for one another as important to us as it was to Jesus? I want us to think about unity within the church and specifically within Pulteney Town and Thrumster Parish churches. How are you doing? Are your relationships with one another characterized by this self-giving, God-glorifying, up-building love? This is the kind of love that Paul described in 1 Corinthians 13. It's a love that is patient, a love that is kind. It does not envy, it does not 
boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. This love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. This love with which we are called to love one another never fails. Is that the kind of love that characterizes your relationships within the church? We might aspire to that, but the reality is often very different, isn't it? It's easy enough to, to like, perhaps even to love, people who are similar to us, but how do we respond within the church to people who are very different from us? C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Screwtape Letters, about a man who becomes a Christian and goes along to his local church for the first time. And as he gets to his pew and he looks around him, he sees just that selection of his neighbours whom he has hitherto avoided. People who might sing out of tune, who might have boots that squeak, who might have double chins or odd clothes. And the devil who hates unity, who loves division instead, will seek to emphasize and exaggerate these trivial things and try to use them to drive a wedge between Christians, to create rifts between people. But Jesus calls us to overlook these differences and to love one another, to be united to one another. Jesus prays for this. Ever since the earliest days of the church, there has been great diversity within the body of Christ. And that's one of the beautiful things about the church. Paul wrote to the Galatians, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All of these divisions, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, these were, were huge barriers within fellowship, uh, within society um, against true fellowship. And these were barriers that were to be overcome by love within the fellowship of believers, within the church. What about unity between churches? We've thought about unity within the church, but what about unity between different de denominations? It's estimated that there are over 22,000 different Protestant denominations around the world. The Indian Christian missionary Sadhu Sundar Singh on a visit to the West in the early 1900s was grieved to observe the, the division that existed within the Western church. He asked the question, how do Christians expect to live together in heaven when they cannot live together on earth? And I think that's a really good question with which to challenge ourselves. I'm not suggesting that we should somehow try to re-amalgamate all of the different denominations, but we should be looking for opportunities to build relationships, to work together for the sake of God's kingdom. One of the great highlights for me 
for my time in Wix so far has been working together with you, with the congregation at Pulteney Town Parish Church to put on the drive-in carol service at Christmas time. I was so grateful for the opportunity for, for myself and for the congregation at Wick Baptist Church to do that. And I pray that in the future we might have more opportunities to, to unite, to work together, to take the gospel to the people of Wick. Maybe as we think together about unity this morning, you find yourself attracted to this vision of unity. But it just seems so idealistic, too good to be true. You might be wondering, well, how could this possibly come about? And I think that we, we find a clue in verse 22. Jesus draws a connection between glory and unity, which I think helps us to answer that question. He prays, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus was glorified on earth through his sacrificial death upon the cross. He was glorified through his perfect obedience to the will of God. He was glorified as he reflected the, the attributes of the Father. And all Christians have been given the glory of Jesus. And as we grow in our faith, the image of Jesus, who himself is the image of the invisible God, grows within us. We become increasingly glorified. The fruits of the Holy Spirit, these attributes that were so perfectly fulfilled in the life of our Lord Jesus, develop within us. These things that we read about in Galatians 5.22 love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of these fruits are relational and all of them help to promote a greater cohesion, a greater unity. And so unity is, is a byproduct of Christian maturity, as we grow, as we undergo this, this process, this work of glorification in our lives, we become more united to those around us who are experiencing the same thing. So what are the effects of this unity? What happens as, as a result if Christians are united together, what should be the, the result of that? Well, there are two things that Jesus says in this prayer will happen. And they're both connected to our witness. A united church shows an unbelieving world that Jesus has been sent by the Father. And a united church demonstrates that the Father loves believers with the same love with which he, he loves the Son. When the church is united and, and believers share together this, this self-giving love that is a powerful witness to the world, to a watching world. Let me read you a very short testimony from a pagan Roman emperor, the Emperor Julian, in the fourth century, as he looked out and as he observed the church. He said, the Christian faith has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. 
It's a scandal. There's not a single Jew who is a beggar. And that the Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we, we should render them. This kind of united, compassionate community was so obvious to the outside world and was one of the reasons why Christianity grew exponentially in the early centuries. And don't we long for this to be true of us? Don't you long for people to look at Pulteney Town parish church and say well that is a community in which they share an incredible love for one another and a love that overflows to the outside there must be something in that something in the message that they are teaching and preaching something unique something in what they're saying about Jesus and God and love before we go on to think about glory, the glory that Jesus wants us to see, I do just want to, to give a note of caution about unity, about the limits of unity. The commentator William Hendrickson writes that believers should always yearn for peace, but never for peace at the expense of the truth. For unity, which has been gained by means of such a sacrifice, is not worthy of the name. And so any unity that we have as Christians must be unity around the truth. It must be unity around God's, God's word, God's revealed truth. This message that the disciples preached, the gospel. If we have to start slicing bits off, slicing and dicing and, and sacrificing some of the foundational truths of the gospel in order to accommodate others, then that is not unity. Let's move on now and, and think about what Jesus says in his prayer about glory, what Jesus prays for us with regards to glory. Even now we, we are able to see something of the glory of the Lord Jesus. Jesus prays that we might see his glory. And we can. And we do. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and said, And, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. But our current vision of Jesus and of his glory is not clear. Paul wrote in another letter to the Corinthian church and he said that we see at the moment as through a glass, darkly. We don't see clearly, but there will come a time when we will see face to face. John wrote something very similar to the church. He said that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall see him truly. And the hope that we have as Christians is that we will one day stand alongside multitudes of others around the throne of the Lamb in heaven. And we will worship Jesus, the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. And we will see him in all of his glory as God. The glory that he has had from eternity past. The glory that he has been given since the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. And the glory that he, he laid aside in order to enter into uh, his, his creation, our world. 
It's not easy for us to imagine this. But I love the attempt that C.S. Lewis once again made in his, his last book of the Narnia series, The Last Battle. The last words in that book are an attempt to, to think about what it might look like to stand before Jesus in heaven. I'm going to read you those last words, but just for anyone who's not familiar with the Narnia series, who hasn't read them, Aslan is a lion, and throughout the Narnia series, he symbolizes Jesus. Aslan is addressing the children, and he says softly to them, there was a railway a real railway accident. Your father and mother and all of you are, as you used to call it in the Shadowlands, dead. The term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now. At last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Lewis was once a convinced atheist. But he became persuaded, he was convicted by the truth claims of Christianity. And this became his hope that he would one day stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he would behold his glory and that he would worship him. And this is our hope too. And this is what Jesus prays for us. And the challenge for us is to remember this. This is especially a challenge for us as we live in a, a comparatively wealthy, affluent society. The great temptation is that we, we start to try and, and create heaven on earth to make for ourselves a little haven of comfort and security. And we, we put all of our, our attention and our, our hope in the here and now. But Jesus promises us so much more. He prays that we will see his divine glory and let us hold out for that. Let us look forward longingly for that great day. Finally, Jesus prays that we might know the Father. We read in verse 26 that Jesus has made known to us the Father's name and he will continue to make it known. To know someone's name in the Bible is to exist in, in harmony with them. In fact, it's even stronger than that. It is to, to love them. And Jesus has opened up a way for us to, to be, to exist in a loving relationship with the Father who is himself love and who we read in Romans has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is the same love with which the Father loves the Son. What an incredible and a glorious privilege this is. We need to reflect and to meditate on these things 
and to rejoice and to worship. My question to you this morning is, do you know this love? Have you been united with the Father through the Son? This is a love that transforms lives and relationships in the present. And it gives us a certain hope for the future that we will one day see the divine glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a love that God the Father offers to all. And I pray that you will accept this love. As we respond in prayer now to this prayer of Jesus for us, let us align our prayers with Jesus' prayers. Let us pray together for a growing unity. Let us pray for a greater yearning to see the glory of Christ both now in the present but ultimately and perfectly in the future. And let us pray for a deeper love for the Father through Jesus the Son. Let's pray just now. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your mercy towards us in sending your son into the world to live a perfect life and to die a criminal's death in our place, taking our sins upon himself. We thank you that you raised Jesus from the dead, that he ascended into heaven and is now seated at your right hand and is interceding for his church. And we pray with him for unity, Forgive us for times when we have nursed and, and held on to petty grievances. We pray that you would help us to love. We remember the words of our Lord Jesus to his disciples. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And we pray for this love to be among us and that the community around the church would recognize and respond to you in light of this love. We pray too, Father, for a clearer vision of your glory in this life. And we long for the day when we will come face to face with our Lord and will see the glory that you have given him. Please give us a desire to know you more and to experience more of you and more of your love in our lives. We pray all these things for ourselves, knowing and rejoicing in the fact that Jesus is praying them too. Amen.
thanks very much for tuning in today folks thank you again to Matt Alexander for providing a sermon for us and I'll see you again soon